Hey, welcome back to AP Precalc. I'm Mr. Kelly. Today we're going to be talking about polynomial functions and rates of change. Now, polynomial, you know that poly means many, right? So we see that in geometry with polygon, and uh, there's a lot of other times you see the word poly around. It means many or much, and if you have a non-constant polynomial, which means it's it's more than just like y equals 2, that's constant, right? It's a function with many terms in the following form. And this is in standard form, and it's pretty general, and it looks a little bit intimidating, but it's not too bad. Essentially what's going on is we have a coefficient here in the front. Each coefficient, it could be, I don't want to say each coefficient is different, they could be different. Most of the time they are. And if you notice, we have an x, and there needs to be a whole number power on x. And uh, in this situation, we have x to the nth power. And then look at the next term. It's n minus 1 and then n minus 2. And all that means is when you have an exponent here, when we put it in standard form, they decrease. So the highest exponented term, exponented, is that a word? But anyways, the, the term with the highest exponent goes first, and then the second highest, all the way down to the very last term, which has x to the 0 power, but we don't need to write that out. x to the 0 power is just a constant number, and that's a sub 0. So let's give you an example right here so you can see what one looks like. So here's a good example. 7x to the 5th minus 3x squared plus 6x minus 2. And if you notice, the exponents on each term decrease in order. So we put the highest exponent term in front, and then the constant, if there is one, or the lowest exponent term at the end of it. We know that the leading term is this thing in the front, which is the a sub n of x to the nth. In this case, it would be 7x to the fifth, right? I mean, so this is called the leading term. The polynomial has degree n. Well, n is the exponent on that leading term. So the exponent here is 5. So we could say, from the example above, the degree of this whole polynomial is 5. And then we would say that the leading coefficient, the leading coefficient, the coefficient is just a sub n. It's just that number in front. We don't include the x. The coefficient is the number that's in front of the x. So in this case, the leading coefficient here in this polynomial would just be 7. So that is a quick review of our polynomial functions here. Leading coefficient, we need to know degree. Remember the degree of the polynomial is the degree of the highest term. We always want to write that first and then in decreasing order with those exponents, and that's called standard form. But sometimes polynomial will not be written in standard form, and you have to look at the variables with the largest exponent. So one of the things teachers like to have their students do is rewrite the polynomial. So I'm going to do that up here. Let's rewrite it. And so when we do this, we have to go through the polynomial, looking at each term, and you find the largest term. That's got to go first. It has the highest degree. You have to be careful of that negative there. Um, it's a minus, but it's really a negative 2, right? So that's going to come in front. That's going to be our leading term, and our leading coefficient is going to be that negative 2. But then we go through each of these terms, and we find the next term that has the highest degree on it, the highest exponent. So that would bring us over here to the 14. And that's a positive 14, so we would write plus 14x squared, and you continue all the way down, plus 6x plus 1. So as we said, the, the degree of the polynomials, whatever the degree of the leading term is, the highest degree of all the terms. So in this case, that would be 6. And the leading coefficient is that coefficient when the function's in standard form. In this case, it would be a negative 2. Common student mistake, they'll look back at the original function and say it's 14, but it's not. It has to be in standard form. So the leading coefficient is negative 2. So next we're going to move down to our local and relative extrema, which are maxima and minima. These are plural words, extrema, maxima, minima. Um, if a polynomial switches from increasing to decreasing, there will be a local or relative maximum. That is the singular, okay? So maxima is when you have several maximums, okay? And then if it sw switches from decreasing to increasing, there'll be a relative or local minimum. What does this mean? Well. All polynomial functions, first off, they are continuous. So I'm going to draw a little function here. That's a pretend polynomial function. All right, so let's suppose we have a function like this. Okay. And polynomial functions are continuous, which means that if you put your pencil on the paper, you will not lift your pencil up, and there's smooth edges, there's nothing rough, uh, there's no points or anything like that. Now. What this says here, this definition, is that if a polynomial switches from increasing, which is this first part of the function, to decreasing, we call this a maximum. Okay, A local or relative maximum 
means that it's a maximum, the highest value in this area. So in this local area, this area right here, this point right here, we would call a maximum because it's the highest point in this area. We also have one down here. This is a local maximum. If you look at it, it's the highest point in the area. You can think of it as being on top of a hill maybe or on top of a mountain. Wherever that is, that is a maximum. And this should make sense, right? Because maximum means the greatest value. It's at the top. So in this area, that is the greatest uh, value. And this area, this is the greatest value. And the same is true if it switches from decreasing to increasing, then we say that is a minimum, okay? So a minimum would occur right here, a local or relative minimum. Local and relative just means uh, in this little area right here, and you have to know both words because some uh, teachers will use local and some will use relative. So we'll use both as the course goes on. We have another local minimum right here. Easy enough, right? So uh, one question that comes up a lot, if you have a function and its domain is restricted, do you include an endpoint here that is part of the function? Is that a local minimum? And based on our definition, the answer is yes. This is a local minimum because in the local area, that is the smallest value in this area right here that's close to it. Now, we also have a local minimum way down here. Do we have any maximums? Well, yeah, up here is a local maximum. So this uh, restricted function right here has two local minimums and it has one local maximum right here. Now we also have a different type of extrema, global or absolute. Now I generally use absolute, but sometimes you'll see the word global. And if you take all of the local maxima, the greatest valued maximum is called the global or absolute maximum. And out of all the minima, the, uh, the smallest, the least is called the global or absolute minimum. Now here we have a function. This is not a polynomial function because you see it has like that little right there in it. I don't know what that's called. Okay, but as we go through this function, let's go through and find all the, the absolute or the global max and mins and then the relative or local maximums or minimums. So the number three here says the absolute min of this function is what? Okay, so I'm gonna look at it. Is there a value that is absolutely in the entire function the least value? And right back here, we just talked about that endpoint. This value right here, this value is negative 2. That is the absolute min when x equals negative 6. Okay, so be very clear. It's the y value that is the min. All right, and it's most frequently we tell where that happens. When x equals negative 6. Does this have an absolute maximum? Well, some students would say right here, but guess what? That arrow means it goes forever. So it goes up forever. And how far does it go? To infinity so there's no value that is the absolute max so we're just going to cross that out and we will write none on that one right there now let's look at the relative mins well just because a point is an absolute min doesn't mean that it's not also a relative min because this is the smallest or the least value in this area so there is a relative min at x equals negative six okay where else so i'm going to look right here this value in this area is the least value, the smallest value. So at x equals negative three, what else we got right here? X equals two. Are there any more? I'm looking around. I think that's it. This is a local minimum, local minimum, local minimum. I think we're good there. Relative max. Okay, a relative maximum. Remember, it's like being on top of a hill. So right here would be one at x equals negative four. Uh, we climb the hill right here. This is the top of a hill here at yeah, x equals 1. And then we would not include anything on the right because, as we said earlier, like there's no value here that's at the top. It just goes forever. So that basically defines our global and absolute extrema from our local or relative. Okay, so now let's look at the characteristics of a polynomial function. Uh, as long as we have a polynomial function that's not a constant, a constant function would be a straight horizontal line, right? That's boring. But as long as we have a non-constant polynomial, we have this rule here. If you have two zeros, there must be at least one local extremum between. Now let's find out why that is. Okay, polynomial functions, I told you this before, they're either increasing or they're decreasing as long as they're not constant, right? So that means I'm gonna make a little function right here we're gonna come up, it's increasing, it goes through the point one zero, we know that that is what we would call a zero or a root, and then 
The only way that you can get to that three if you're increasing is if you start decreasing, right? And whatever else the polynomial function does, but that increasing, changing to decreasing, that creates a maximum right here. It's not the only possibility. Let me erase this. We could also have a function that starts out decreasing, right? And we know, let's suppose it's increasing here, but then it's decreasing. The only way to get back to that three is to increase again. And that would create somewhere here, there would be a minimum. That's not also the only thing that could happen. It is also possible that you have a polynomial function that really likes to dance. And so it's increasing, maybe decreases, maybe increases. In this case, we would get two extrema right here, a maximum and a minimum. And so that gives us this rule here. If you have two zeros, there must be at least, we're not sure, but at least one local extremum between those two zeros. So here's an example using function notation. If we have a polynomial function f, and f of negative two is zero, f of zero is five, f of four is zero, and f of seven is negative one. Are there any guaranteed extrema? And if so, we're gonna state where they occur. So I would say what? We gotta find out where the zeros are. The zeros in this function are one and three. Where are the zeros here? The zero would be at x equals negative two. That gives you a zero. Remember, a zero is where the y value equals zero. And then at x equals four, that would be a zero. And this other one, f of zero, that's thrown in, that's put in there to throw you off a little bit. That is a y-intercept. But we could look at these two zeros. We know between negative two and four, there must be an extremum. And we don't know what it is necessarily without some more information, but we could write it in inequality notation or as an interval. There must be at least one. Did I say at least one? Let me say at least one. There we go, that makes me feel a little more happy when I do it correctly, at least one. Okay, one more thing left here. We're gonna talk about even degrees, uh, mean that you have an absolute extrema somewhere. If a polynomial has an even degree, there is either an absolute min or an absolute uh, maximum. Even degree, what does that mean? I'm gonna show you an example here. What is an even degree? Let's start with our very basic one. Y'all you done this before. How about y equals x, and it's gotta be even, so we'll do x squared. Y'all know what that means, right? That looks kinda like this. Okay, one of the things we learned about our polynomial functions in Algebra 2 is that even degrees, they have the same, we call it end behavior, like they either both go up or they're both gonna go down the, at each end of this function. So if you have a positive leading coefficient, like this is a positive one, we didn't write it, but a positive one right here, that means you'll have an absolute minimum because on either end of it, it's going to be increasing. Whereas if we have a negative leading coefficient, remember what that does to this u in the quadratic, it flips it over. So that means that we're going to have somewhere an absolute maximum. Let's pull that down over here. Okay, so this only occurs with even degreed polynomial functions. We know that somewhere, even if it's, even if the degree is crazy high and you have a lot of twists and you know, curves in it. If it has a, a negative leading coefficient, it might look something like this, you know. Oh, that is crazy ugly. But somewhere along this polynomial function is an absolute maximum. Okay, so we can look at these different functions and tell, is there an absolute maximum or minimum for each function? The first thing we need to determine is, is it even degreed? Because if it was odd, like x cubed, you would have either end of it go to infinity. We'll talk more about that later. So here, is there an absolute max or min? We look at all of the different terms. This is positive and it's even, right? So that'd be the same as x squared, y equals x squared. So three x to the fourth, yes, that would have a minimum, we would say. Okay, and now we look at b. We're gonna find, uh, what do we got the degree here is six, but it's negative, right? So that's more like this function here. So we would say this function for part b would have an absolute maximum. Remember, because that negative is going to make it go down on both the left and the right hand side. But we'll talk about end behavior a little in 1.6. And part C, what do you think about this one? Does it have an absolute minimum or an absolute maximum? And the answer is no way, man. Look at that. We got an odd degree right there. So odd degree polynomial functions do not have absolute extrema. But they might have local or relative. They probably do, right? So just not absolute extrema. Okay, one more thing to do. And that is to talk about the point of inflection. And 
really, we kind of mentioned it before in the earlier lesson, the point of inflection occurs at input values where the rate of change changes from increasing to decreasing. So let's look at this function right here. We see the slope is really high at this part, right? The slope, oh my God, it's going straight up so quickly. And then the slope is decreasing. You can notice how the slope is decreasing. The slope is decreasing. Like a line right here would look like this. Oh, Mr. Kelly, do your best. And then a line, if you move to the right a little, looks like this. And then a line looks like this. If you notice the line is positive to zero to negative. So this whole time, the slope is decreasing until this point right here, where the slope is here. Now it starts to tilt back the other way and go up, right? So we have a slope like this, and then a slope of zero again, and then the slope is positive. So these areas where the slope is decreasing and then change to increasing, that is called a point of inflection or an inflection point. This part of the graph we would say is concave down. Whereas this part down here we'd say is concave up. So this occurs when the graph is changing from concave up to concave down. And some students have a hard time remembering which one is which. So concave up is like a cup. So this part right here is concave up and concave down is like a frown, right? So right here we got a frown. It's looking pretty frowny. Right here is a frown, so it's concave down. Okay, so those points where it changes from concave up to concave down, that is called a point of inflection. And I think that's all we have right here for you folks. I wish you the best and hope you get the absolute maximum you can on your mastery check. This is Mr. Kelly. Remember, it's nice to be important, but it's more important, guys. See ya!